Welcome to the One Life, One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morse. Today, I have a really, really good friend of mine, uh, my friend Chris from Saves a Day. And I, I'll call you that. I'm not going to really, I can have to say your last name really or no? Nah. Is it Connolly or Conley? I was, Conley. Yeah, I knew that. Uh, well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, man. I'm uh, so psyched, so honored to be here. I'm psyched to have you in my kitchen. Um, I ran into you like maybe, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, our, our show somewhere. I forgot what that was. Yeah. I hadn't seen you in a long time, though. Yeah, it'd been a minute. Um, for the listeners who don't know anything about you, what I like to do on this podcast is like to do kind of like a history of you to know um, what inspired you, where you came from, to lead you up to where you are at this moment. So uh, you were born and raised in New Jersey? Yep, born in New Jersey, in uh, Flemington, New Jersey. Flemington, I never heard of Flemington, actually. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of out of the way, but okay. it's, I went to school in Princeton my whole life. Okay. Um, and um, at that school... Uh, in first grade, everybody had to pick an instrument to be part of the orchestra. You had to. Yeah. So um, they they brought in like all the instruments, the music instructors, and like played each one in front of everybody, and you got to pick what you wanted to play. And I really loved the sound of the cello, so I picked the cello. Sick. And I so you you just had to be in orchestra, so you get thrown into it. And they were teaching everybody by this thing called the Suzuki method. Okay. Where they don't teach you how to read music. You have to they send you home with tapes and it'll be like Mozart and Bach melodies you gotta learn by ear. So I'm like six years old. Oh shit. Yeah, trying to figure out these like really basic melodies, but it was super hard, you know, because I had n- you know no idea where to put your hands or anything. Yeah. So anyway, that was the beginning of my musical journey. And um I liked it enough to stay with it for seven years yeah so you only had to do it the one year but i stuck with it for the next seven years holy Um, shit so and i you we traveled other schools and played like classical music everywhere so it was really really cool training early on and because it was suzuki method it trained my ears really really early Mm -hmm. so to like listen for and i didn't know that later on that would be very handy totally um but then so then i got into um grunge when it came out like i was i was into like guns and roses yeah and aerosmith and led zeppelin that was like my shit when i was young that was the first kind of music you listened to yeah i was like when appetite for destruction came out i just loved it like i i would listen to it all night long i'd stay up listening to it and it's really dangerous they're cursing and stuff <laughs> and uh and Rebellious. i i love them so i had po- guns and roses posters all over my room Wow. Yeah. And then um, Aerosmith put out that record, uh, Pump, in, I think, 1990, 89 or 90. And I loved that song, What It Takes. Uh, okay. It's like the last song in the album. I don't know if you've ever Deep heard that cuts. record, but that's a good record. Yeah. And, I've heard um, that song. And then, so then my parents got me a CD player. It was right when CD Walkman came out. Yeah. The Discman, rather. And so I would go to the stores and buy like all of their records I could find. So I got into their 70s records. Like back. Uh, and that's some good, good rock and roll. Yeah. And through that, then I got into like Led Zeppelin and whatnot. And Led Zeppelin became my favorite band ever. I was like obsessed. And I'm watching the movie, The Song Remains the Same all the time, where they're playing Madison Square Garden. And like Jimmy Page is like banging the, the Les Paul with the cello bow. Oh, shit. So I was like, that's so cool. So I get start wanting to play rock and roll. But I wanted to play uh, drums because I love John Bonham. I was obsessed with John Bonham. So I remember the moment I was on a trip with my dad in his blue Mazda. We're going up to upstate New York to have like a weekend in a cabin somewhere. Yeah. And I'm listening to Stairway to Heaven on repeat. In the moment where the drums come in, it's all crack, dunk, dunk, dunk. Super simple fill, but it like ignited me. Mm -hmm. I was like lit up with excitement. And I just turned to my dad. I go, Dad, I want to play drums. Like, wow. I suddenly realized, I was just this kid playing orchestra, but I suddenly realized I wanted to play drums. And he's like, okay, let's talk about it when we get home. <laughs> so that we get home the next week, and he's like, okay, I've been thinking about it. And I grew up on this farm in, like, kind of the, the middle of nowhere. And the, the neighbors are not very close, but there's it's so sparse that he's like, if you, you know, I think if you're playing your drums out in the barn, I grew up on this sick farm. It's crazy. If you're playing your drums out in the barn... Our neighbor's going to hear it, and it's going to disturb the quiet. It was a really peaceful, quiet place. Yeah. So he's like, how about we get a classical guitar? So we went down to the music store that day, and he got me a classical guitar. And uh, it kind of made sense to me because of the cello. Yeah. And so I taught myself Stairway to Heaven 
as wow the, and so that's how i got into playing music and right away that first day i started coming up with my own riffs and like led zeppelin had a lot of like single note riffs yeah. i was into riffs like sabbath riffs and stuff like that and i could do it on my own without having even learned the guitar because it was a lot like the cello yeah, yeah yeah so right away i'm just coming up with riffs and i was just like in a candy store man I was how old were like, you i was 13 so i played cello from when i was 6 to 13 and then i dropped the cello and just went head first into guitar and writing my own songs. And right around that time, Rage Against the Machine came out. And so my our, the only other original member of Saves the Day ever was our drummer, Brian. You yeah. remember Brian? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we went to school together our whole life. Um, but so he, uh, he was a drummer and he would go to this place, the Princeton Record Exchange, all the time because they had on their bulletin board, they had like, flyers for people that were looking for bandmates and stuff he was always looking to play in a band so one day he got this flyer um that says like looking for hardcore drummer uh and he's like (laughs) what's that you know what's what he he pulls off the tab calls the number they're like come on down and and rehearse with us so he gets the gig and they're this band from uh, trenton called a nation in transit okay and they loved hardcore so that's how he started to hear about hardcore Gotcha. So because they, they turned him on to Rage when Rage came out because of um, Inside Out. Cause they go. So they knew about Zach before. Yeah. And so um, Brian is like, yo, you love Zeppelin. Like, check out Rage Against the Machine because all these riffs are just like Led Zeppelin riffs. Wow. Yeah, so he gives me that record and just I flipped on that. And so we started trying to like write songs like that. And at first we we're like rapping. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, dude. Are you serious? Yes, rapping. Is there recordings the... of that? No, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to hear that shit. But it was like right when PC was becoming a thing, and um, Tipper Gore with the parental advisory yep. stickers and stuff. So we were like writing like political lyrics because it was like a la rage. Holy shit! And then um, had you been to a show yet or a concert? No, I had never been to a con. I actually I went to two Aerosmith concerts. Okay. One time I told my dad, Dad, the only thing I want to do in life is go see Aerosmith. He's like, okay, I think we can make that happen. Holy so I saw shit. Aerosmith at the Spectrum and then Madison Square Garden. Those are my first two concerts. Damn. It was so dope. Concrete Blonde opened one of them. And um, it was Linda Perry's band. They did. Um, oh, yeah. The Leaders? No, no, no. They What's did it? that song, uh, What's Going On. What's going on? It was really, really dope. But I forgot that was. I forget what they was were. Was it like, dun 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 Doon, 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 doon. I don't know this what This one was, uh, do you know what it's called? Uh, uh, I'm going to go Four Non Blondes. Four Non Blondes. And I said, There's a lot of blondes, hey, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of blonde stuff yeah. happening. <laughs> I don't know if Aerosmith was into that name. Uh, it, seems like it seems like your parents are totally, that was one of my questions, it seems like your parents are very open-minded and supportive at a Extremely young age. Extremely cool. And it's, it's curious too, because they're both judges. They're like serious people. Yeah. And uh, they let me develop into this freak <laughs> you know, like, so you only child only child okay and um so grunge happens and uh brian and i were super into it and he used to call up this the princeton radio station all the time to try to win tickets to shows and stuff so okay. one day he wins tickets to go see offspring at city gardens oh shit legendary punk club in trenton yeah man so we go and like honestly we didn't like really want to see offspring we were in, more into green day um, but it was sheer terror opening. What? Yep. And then it's crazy. And then bill. rancid. Wow. And I'm right up front against the stage, and I see rancid, and it changed my life forever. And literally the next day, I dyed my hair green. Holy and shit! And my parents didn't say anything. Like they were like, "Okay, all right, he's uh, he's a little different." Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah, and like overnight I was just like over the moon for punk rock. Okay. And all the songs I started writing like went start we started out sounding a lot like Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, and like I was obsessed with Sunny Day Real Estate, Jawbox, Archers of Loaf. Yep. Overnight I start writing songs that sound like Rancid. And uh and then we became like this punk band and we were always like every couple months we'd be changing our name and but there was a scene starting to form in Princeton. Bands would come. You guys came. Yeah. You came to the Princeton Arts Council. I just yes. got goosebumps. Because oh, remember shit. in the show, Brian told me about you guys. He saw you first and he said, Chris, you are gonna love this band, H2O. They sing. Because <laughs> he tried, tried to. to he tried to yeah. get me into like hardcore music, you know, but the only stuff I liked was Lifetime 
and Gorilla Biscuits. And then I loved Minor Threat and I loved Embrace. Awesome. And Dag Nasty. Of course. So like that was my... I was seven seconds. Seven seconds. That was yes. my shit. Yeah. And so when you guys came out, it was like perfect for me and and so he took me to see you guys at the princeton arts council like the next week or something wow man and it was the coolest show i've ever seen i mean there was like that remember that the, the room was really small but they packed in like 200 hardcore kids yeah everyone's singing along you guys play five-year plan and it's that like three-part harmony thing mm -hmm. and i was just like what is this <laughs> it's awesome and i man. killed that record man i listened to that record like i destroyed the booklet Awesome. <laughs> you know? Thank you, man. Yeah, dude. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so how were how were you in school? I was a really good student. I spoke at my graduation. Yeah, I was like that guy. Good good grades. Super good grades. Yeah. We had like a one through four system and one was the best. My senior year was all ones. Damn. It was in AP classes. I liked learning. It took a while to for that to click because I was pretty like anti authority guy. I was like, this, you know, they're telling us what to do and Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But as something happened like kind of around junior year what I, I just got like really inspired by learning all this cool stuff. We were, it was a really cool school, a progressive school. So we were learning art history, philosophy. Yeah. And um, I just started taking a poetry class. Okay. And that's how I started to learn how to write. Gotcha. And that was really exciting. As soon as I did that, I was sort of unlocked emotionally. Yeah. And so things just started to flow more. Yeah. And, um, and so I really dove into school, and then Brian and I both got into NYU together. Oh, she was gonna ask you like, what was your what was your goals? Like, would you want to do when you go to school? I was going to pursue creative writing. Okay. I think I would have become like maybe a a playwright. Like I was writing plays in school, and um, June after junior year in high school, uh, my my school uh, put me up for this program called the governor school, which is this thing over the summer that you, all these kids got to, if you got selected for it, you got to spend a whole summer at the college of New Jersey, taking college level courses in the, in the, uh, the path that you wanted to pursue. Yeah. So I, they, they, um, they put me up for this thing and I got in and there's like 10 other nine or 10 other kids from New Jersey that all got into the creative writing program. They also had like dance and theater and visual arts and stuff as well. Yeah. So I went to this thing, the governor's school, um, that summer of 1997, we had just made the Saves the Day demo tape in April. Oh, shit. And right away, like we had already talked to Steve Reddy because we were starting to play hardcore shows and yeah. he calls Sean McGrath one day who's in Mouthpiece and Hands Tied. Hands Tied put out a seven inch on EVR. He's like, yo, Sean, I hear you're playing with these kids from New Jersey. What's that all about? So Steve had already come to see us play, and we he's played awesome. a show in like Pennsylvania with like Ten Yard Fight, and he's like, "All right, all right, this is cool. Let's make a record," you know. So it's awesome. We, so we get so already when I went to that governor's school, I already knew that we were gonna make a record for EVR. So I'm like psyched, and the whole summer I'm do, r pursuing cr uh, my creative writing, yeah, writing poems and plays and short stories at this program, and it was such an incredible experience. I wound up winning the governor's medal for creative writing Holy through this shit. program. So I get this medal from the governor. It's wow. wild. So anyway, I go back to school and that, that senior year during the winter break, we recorded our first album. Yep. Can't slow down. And, uh, and that was December of 1997. Brian and I go back to high school. We get into NYU. We know we're going to go to NYU, but after we graduated, EVR sent us on tour with Bain. Wow. So we got graduate <laughs> high school. We hit the road with Bane. It was their first tour. Okay. And they took us like immediately under their wing and yeah. like so supportive. They could tell we really cared about music, even though yeah. we sounded different. We went on tour with them and like all the other bands were like screaming, you know, the, the, the sick, like shouting yeah. um, vocals, like from the bottom of your gut, you know? Yeah. And I'm like up there, like this little kid, like singing. I remember. Um, but they like got it that we were like into what we were doing. Yeah. So by the end of the tour, we wound up in Worcester at this place called the space and they had told all their friends like, yo, come out and support this band. Yep. And it was the first show that we ever played where like people, we felt that love from the hardcore people scene. along and stuff. Yep. And, and, and it was really incredibly special. And so we went back to NYU and we would be book, booking shows on the weekends and going playing like as far away as we could we could go and yeah. then make it back to school just keep writing papers we <sighs> did that and then that winter cancel it down comes out in august that winter um we went on tour with fast break and far side 
Yeah. Um, and that was an incredible experience, but there was a lot more people coming out and singing along. There'd be like 25 people who knew the words where we'd go and that was like, holy shit, this is so cool. Yeah. Go back to NYU and the whole, that whole year I'm writing what is to become through being cool. So I'm like going over to Brian's dorm with my guitar and showing him riffs and stuff. And he's like six. So we're like writing the songs in his bedroom. Yeah, that's crazy. And then, yeah, we booked time after that spring semester to go in with Steve Evitz at Tracks East in New Jersey. And we shred the record. We know it's good. We could hear how good it is. Like we were psyched on it. And we were yeah. like, yo, let's defer for a year and let's just tour on this thing and just see what happens. And that's that 20 was years ago. 20 years ago. Fuck, man. Yeah. So. Are you still in college when that record comes out? Do you guys stay in college? So we, the record came out in November, and yeah. we had decided already to take that whole year off. We assumed we would just yeah. go back after that year. Yeah. But the record comes out, and people started flipping out. Like people, now it was like 40, 50 people coming out to see us, and they were like really enthusiastic. We, and the, and the, ste- the scene really started happening. There was more yeah. and more bands. Yeah. Everywhere we go, there's really cool bands, and we're starting to play with, you know, there's like Alkaline Trio, Newfound Glory, yeah. there's like uh, Juliana Theory, um, and all these bands that are all kind of like in the same vein, Yeah, you know, and the scene starts coming together, and yeah. uh, and and we had more of a place to belong, and everybody's into the same stuff, and kids that were like going to the mall before now have a place to go, and it's like skate kids, yeah, and hardcore kids and punk kids all in this at the same shows. And yeah, it was really magical time. I was just gonna say magical time. I feel like a lot of those genres are kind of like all all connecting at that point. It wasn't just hardcore kids; it was all mixed. Kids who listen to Newfound Glory, listen to Mab, all listen all diverse. And all yeah. come to shows together. It was yeah. cool, man. Yeah, and then it just blew up from there. And just and think of all the amazing bands that <clears throat> come from this world. It's, yeah, it's really cool. So that record came out and just and it just automatically did awesome. It was it was really special and it well was received. like instantaneous and it was electrifying. Yeah, yeah. So what year did we do that tour? That I guess we did that tour with you twenty years ago. Yeah, it was twenty years ago. You guys had like, no motive. I think that was the first tour for that record like first full u.s tour yeah for that record and when we got that so you guys gave us a shot <laughs> um we got the call we were in indianapolis okay. one night on tour and uh we get this call for i don't know who called us but somebody calls says yo h2o is a show in connecticut tomorrow night at the skate park um and they need a, a band to play and they asked you guys if you if you could come play and we're in indianapolis and it's the next night in connecticut Shit. We're like, holy shit, we drop everything. Fuck. We cancel the next show or whatever, and we drive overnight to Connecticut to come play that show with you guys. And holy it was basically shit, thank like, you, man. Dude, it, thank you, man, <laughs> because it was like basically like, if you guys do do good here and like they like you, there's a chance that they might take you on the road. And so, so we crazy, show up, man. we play the six skate punk show, and it was the first time we ever got to play with you. Yeah. And it was a dream come true. And it was really, really fun. It was a great show. We hit it off right away. Yeah. And within like a month or so, you guys asked us to go on that tour. And that tour was a, a game changer, man. It, was a, it ch- like changed my life. That was a crazy fucking tour, too. I think that show in Connecticut, Jamie Josta put that on. He used to book yeah, shows yeah. there. Yeah, Jamie booked us. That's, how, 13, that's yeah. how it was. Jamie was our booking agent. He was? Yeah, man. Holy shit. Shout out to Jamie. Holy shit, <laughs> yeah. he booked you guys? Yeah. Okay, so that was a show. Yeah, that was a freaking skate That park. was it. Wow, man. Yeah, man. That, that, was a, that night changed my life. Wow. And then we went on that tour. How long was that tour for? It seemed like a long tour. Yeah, it was a long tour. I feel like it was maybe eight weeks, at least yeah. four to six. I mean, we, we used to call um, Ted Teddy Madball. <laughs> you come out to Freddie's part. Yeah, that's right. Oh, oh my, my God. God I dude. forgot about that. <laughs> that is so sick. Um, yeah, the tour was super, super amazing. Um, I, forget, it was, I guess it was a month long, right? Yeah, the shows were great. You guys had such a great crowd. Kids were coming to see you guys. You guys were really like... And you guys were so nice to us. You know, we were like really young kids, but you really were just like open arms and uh, you taught us so much, and you were such good dudes. Thank you, man. So right away in our early touring career, we got to learn from the the best, you know? Thank like you, Like how man. to do this right. Thank you, man. Yeah. After that tour, it was just like, psh, for you guys are right, you think? Yeah, exactly. Like right after that, we get on, then we get taken out by Face to Face. Fuck. And we're on tour with Trio and Newfound, and it's a package, and like things really took off. Like that was the birth of that whole 
next phase of everything. Yeah, did you feel like at that at that point that you this is going to be your life, your career? I guess I didn't think that far down the road. It you know, it was like years into it that I realized, holy shit. <laughs> this is this is what's up. This yeah. is happening. Cuz you were, were you still so you took that year off of school, did you ever go back? No, but I think we we still kind of assumed that we would until yeah. it, the momentum just swept us away and we were in it. Damn, man. Yeah. It so was it was a, a full time thing. So you weren't working in between tours and stuff? Nope. We were just and we were playing constantly. Just constantly. And uh and E V R Equal Vision was so supportive and they were like so psyched too. Like, who are these people buying these records? You know, Steve always says we couldn't figure out who's buying your records. <laughs> yeah, we were you guys on the radio too on that record? College radio, yeah. yeah college we got, radio. We did yeah. a lot of college radio and and uh And there's a video was getting played too a little bit. Maybe? There was, yeah. We did a video M T V two, I think. With maybe. um this dude Darren who did uh the Blink One Eighty Two video, Damn It. Oh shit. And so E V R knew him and he came out, recorded the video for Shoulder to the Wheel, and it was like this is before the internet, so it was really like yeah. getting played on um sort of like basic cable you know <laughs> <laughs> what's crazy about that back then too is the buzz you guys had was just word of mouth from people actually going out and seeing you play live or hearing the record it wasn't like internet shit it was really yeah, cool that like was like flyers and yeah, word of what's mouth that? Yeah. yeah right <laughs> but i'm saying it's it's cool that just like you created your own not buzz but just because of how good you guys were and and your live performance that people want to come see it wasn't just like oh i saw them on youtube or something like that yeah it's, man we were we were so lucky yeah, and yeah. so that record, how long? So you guys toured on that for how long? You think we toured on that for two straight years, and it just kept going up and up and up. And then we get hooked up with Vagrant Records. That's right. And uh, we was played, that a weird transfer? Like leaving? Equal no, Vision it was. Per, it was hard to leave Equal Vision because it was just like home, yeah, and family, yeah. Um, but it was also like this opportunity. It was that time. You, yeah, you kind of couldn't ignore it, and. Um, we played this crazy fest in in Louisville. Louisville yeah, crazy year. with a K. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, one year um, with get the Get Up Kids. Yep, and um, they were like the Midwest invasion. Like they were, it was like the British invasion, but <laughs> like they were so huge. <laughs> they were so huge. I and remember like that. that show, it was like the biggest rock show I've ever seen. I never forget how many people were there singing along to yeah. their, their jams. They just put out um, the Red Letter Day EP and like everyone's singing along. We, we were obsessed with that EP. Okay. But at that show, they announced that they had just signed a Vagrant Records. We'd gotcha. never heard of Vagrant, but we Me were either. like intrigued. We were like, wow, okay, wow, Get Up Kids are like moving up. So the day Through Being Cool came out, actually November 2nd, 1999, I go, uh, I go home like after doing something and on my, my answering machine, there's a message from Kevin Kasatsu, who was working at uh, at Vagrant. He said, "Hey, I'm from Vagrant Records, and uh, we love your new record. We love to fly you guys out to California and have a meeting, talk, to see if you guys want to work together." Damn. So we knew that the Get Up Kids were going to Vagrant, so we were like, "Yo, we got to go meet these people." Why not? So we yeah. fly out to California. It's like <laughs> sunshine, glittering sidewalks. We're just like in heaven. Yeah. And we go and meet them, and they were the same. They were cut from the same cloth, the same kind of people, the same ethos, the yeah. same heart, the same spirit. They cared about music and art in the same way. Is that Rich Egan too? Rich Egan, yep. John Cohen, and Kevin Kasatsu. And um, we were we loved them immediately. They yeah. were and so we were like, okay, we were getting like the dinners and stuff with like bigger labels and people that wanted to like Schmoozing turn us into the next Blink one eighty two and stuff. And we were like, this is not comfortable. The suits just it didn't fit. It wasn't our vibe. We were yeah. like punk kids. Yeah. And so Vagrant was like real, real people, real scene. And instantly we we're like, okay, we could totally make this transition and be comfortable. So actually, on the tour we were doing together, when we had that van accident. Yeah, I was going to talk. Rusty might come in because Rusty has a really, a really good perspective of because he was the first one kind of there. But let's talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. So when that happened, you guys pick us up on the side of the road. The van is smashed. The trailer smashed. You picked up all of our gear that was like strewn about the highway. You put it in the bays of your of your bus, and Ted and Brian go with you guys, and Eben and David and I go to the hospital because we were banged up. And Steve, David, Steve, Steve Looker, David, Steve yeah, Looker and David's was, teeth was in the steering wheel. David's teeth were in the steering wheel. He was driving, no seatbelt. He gets thrown up against the windshield, smashes his head. Yeah, black, we slip out on on black ice, spin around the highway, crash down the embankment. David's like smashed into the 
steering wheel, it teeth was first, crazy, man. teeth are gone, blood all, all over the snow. And Teddy was in our bus, though, I think. Ted yeah. Was, okay. Oh, somebody... yeah. Oh, yeah. Ted and Brian were already in your bus. Yes. Because the night with before, us. we played with Kill Your Idols in Chicago. And you guys. You have a great memory, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was Kill Your Idols, and we had to drive overnight to Minneapolis. and But our van got towed in Chicago. And so we had to go and get it out, and it took hours and hours and hours. So like by the time we got on the road to Minneapolis, it's hell of late. So we have to drive all the way through the night, and that's how we like. We're it's so dark, we don't see the over on the overpass. There's black ice, and we hit it. So um, did you get fucked up in there too? Right? Yeah, I broke my collarbone, and that's they right. had me in one of those like flat beds with the your necks like you know braced and yeah. you can't move and that was like nightmarish holy fuck anyway, we had to spend like a week getting better david had to, have, had to have all this reconstructive surgery on his face and they're like wound up taking bones out of his jaw to rebuild his nose and everything holy sh- didn't you guys come back on the tour though exactly so we were like we knew <laughs> we weren't gonna miss this tour we, were, we knew the opportunity to get to tour with you guys and we weren't gonna miss it we weren't gonna miss out so our van was smashed though so vagrant records we hadn't signed with them yet they go, yo, we're gonna we're gonna drive you out a van, a brand new van, so you can finish this tour. And it was Kevin Kasatsu drove from L.A. to La Crosse, Wisconsin, Holy met us, shit. met us, picked us up. David had to stay behind for more surgery, but we drove out. We met you guys again in Seattle at okay. the, sh- at the uh, show show uh, show it place used to be El Corazon. Yeah, something like that. Show place, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was El Corazon. It's like under that overpass, and it's like sick, sick venue. How so many days did you guys miss at the tour? We only missed a week, and I think it was maybe five shows. Um, but we got right back, and I'm I'm in a sling. I remember that? And uh, but we played, and Stephen Looker learned all of David's parts, so we could have That's two right. guitar players. And then David flew out and met us the next night in Portland. And then we were back. David had no teeth. I'm oh smashed God, up. We're dude. all banged up, like hurt to play. Fucking but, troopers, though, man. Yeah, man. I mean, we weren't, weren't going to miss it, man. Shout out to Steve Looker. Yeah, dude. Holy shit. That's, so how many how many more shows do we have on the tour after that, you think? We had like, we were only like halfway. So, you know, that's, we, we made it halfway through the country, got smashed up, met you on the other side and finished up. Fuck, thank you for that, man. Thank oh, you, You guys dude. are young, too. I'd probably be like, I'm going home. Fuck that. Like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> That yeah, was dude. so scary. I remember that, man, because I forget, I remember Rusty getting up and running out there and seeing all that. It was just... It was crazy, dude. I mean, that it was... was a, so scary, right? So Fuck. scary. Like, I was asleep in the back because it was overnight drive, and, like, we weren't wearing seatbelts. Not even... David wasn't even wearing a seatbelt. We're seatbelts, So kids. stupid. So stupid. And I woke up to David screaming, like, bloody murder, screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. You could feel the van, like, starting to fishtail. And it was just like you you could feel that you like we were about to die. And did you, it happen really fast after that? It happened like, super fast. We flip out, f- uh, slide down the embankment, slam onto the right side of the the van, and right in the back, so I crunched into the side of the van. That's how I broke my collarbone. And then we flip back up onto our wheels, and as we flip back up, the trailer snapped off and flew down down the road, and it wound up upside down. But it was so tightly packed that none of the gear got hurt. Oh my god! So that's why you man. guys pulled all that out, put it in the bays, and took it, and that's how we were able to like just meet back up with you. And uh, I'm surprised no car smashed into the trailer or anything either. We were really so. lucky; it happened at that time because no one else was on the road. Yeah, you know, it was the middle of the night, middle of the morning, early, early hours. Did your Did your um parents come out or anything like my that my mom or? flew out she had bought the van for us and it was under her insurance Damn. you know so she had to deal with the insurance anyway but it was totally uh it was totaled it was completely smashed but she was just glad that nobody died because yeah. when she took a look at it i think it really scared her like the thing looked like i mean it was just like smashed to smithereens it was yeah and like, she probably didn't... wanted you to come home too like i think she was probably really scared about that and she maybe maybe wanted us to come back but she didn't say anything my mom is like the most supportive ever in fact she's it's amazing man ever since we started making merch i have never seen her wear anything besides saves the day t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> dude that's so fucking cool yeah, i'm sure yeah, she's been dude. a bunch of your shows too she's, right yeah she just flew out for the new jersey uh, 20th anniversary three oh, cool shows man. she said it was the best one ever so that was really special to have her there my dad was there and uh are they together still 
No, they're not. But okay. uh, like they they've always been supportive, and it is surprising because they're like these big time judges, and they my dad always wanted me to be you know like a a lawyer or even like an engineer or something. Like he wanted me to be sort of more legit. <laughs> and at first, when I took that year off school, he was like, "I don't know about this." He talked to all his you know judges and lawyer friends, and they're like. We don't know if Christopher should do this. You know? Oh shit! Now, like fast forward, and now he's like, they're all so proud of you, and they all have Google alerts. They follow you. They can't believe you get to do it. You know, do what you love as for for a living. You're such a lucky kid, and so now he's like really psyched on it. So <laughs> fucking amazing, man! Yeah. How many years has the band been together for now? 1997, April oh, yeah. April 1997. So it's been 20, 22 years. Twenty two years. Oh shit! Yeah. Fuck. So okay. So let's get to the next record, which is two thousand and one, right? Yes. Um, stay what you are. Yeah. Stay what you are. Um. So where were you at that point? So were you guys pretty big at that point before that record came out, and it was like an anticipated record. It was. Yeah, we were definitely happening. One of the bigger bands, like in that scene, and Vagrant was really psyched for our new material, and we had done um, like two test recordings for them, um, and put out two two songs on on a compilation called Another Year on the Streets. Okay. And we kind of did that as a test. They were like, they wanted to see where we were going. We put out two songs, uh, Sell Mail, Close Them Off to Heaven, and a song called A Dragon D Flat. And so they liked our the direction we were heading in. Yeah. And so then we we're getting ready to record the next album, and we were going to do it again with Steve Evitz. Okay. Um, but he was busy with Sepultura. Oh, shit. And um, Shout out to Sepultura, my people. Yeah. And and hate breed. So he oh, was going to be busy for six months, and we were like itching to record this thing. Of course. So we were toying on that same record for so long. Too. Exactly. And we had all the songs. And it's cool, though, because if we'd made the record right then, there would have been like three or four songs that wouldn't have made it to stay where you are. They weren't written yet. Yeah. So it wound up being uh, happening on its own time. That's a good lesson. Like things will happen on their own time. Yeah. But we also have to find a new producer. And so we tested out all these producers listening to all these different people and the vibe wasn't right. We'd meet with people and wasn't we just didn't feel it. But then we met this guy, Rob Schnaff. He's yeah. the guy that discovered Elliot Smith and Beck and stuff like that. Wow. So we were, used to drive around listening to Elliot Smith all the time. So when we got the chance to meet him, we were like, oh my God, we love his records. Yeah. And we met him and he was the coolest dude. He was so hungover after this <laughs> <laughs> Guided by Voices show in New York. And those guys can drink. They're like power drinkers. So yeah. he, he showed up. He's like in sunglasses, like in this meeting. And he seemed like a jerk. But okay. we like... <laughs> I always laugh about it now. Like we thought he just hated us. Yeah. But but we met with them and then he said yes, he wanted to make the record. We we're like, okay, sick. Oh my God, we get to make a record with this guy. Yeah. So we come out to LA, first time making a record out here and there's something about the sunshine out here. I wrote two two brand new songs right when we got here. Two of my favorite songs on that record, a song called Cars and Calories and a song called Certain Tragedy. And right when we wrote those, there was like California sunshine that was like infused in these songs and Got suddenly you. it was like poppier mm. and i had also gotten into the beatles just that year Interesting. i didn't like the beatles growing up because i thought it was just like i want to hold your hand like i just didn't like it but then uh on the way to mixing one day for through being cool i was like digging around the back of my car for a tape to listen to yeah and i pick up the blue tape it's like the beatles greatest hits in the later half of their career but it wasn't my tape i have no idea how it got in my car and i wouldn't mm. have put it on but i was just bored of all my other tapes and i was like all right i'll <laughs> listen to this and the songs were so cool and so weird that right away that day began began my obsession with the beatles Holy and i show shit. up to the studio i'm like so late too i like that though. i know yeah i was 20 and actually i was 19 making that record so i show up to the studio and I tell steve that i just found this beatles tape he's like oh my god that's my favorite band so Steve started to get me into the Beatles and like educating me about the Beatles. And he told me to get this book, The Beatles, Com Complete Beatles Scores or something like that. It's a book of like all the Beatles songs with lyrics and chords and piano and like okay. all the horn parts. And I started learning Beatles songs. Wow. And that's how I started to grow more as a guitar player and as a songwriter. And so by the time we start working with Rob, I'm writing songs at a different level. Gotcha. And just growing so much and getting to make that record with him was really, really important. He could see that I was stretching for more on the guitar, yeah. but I didn't know. Like, I was just a punk kid that came from cello. So I was playing like simple stuff. Yeah. 
with three notes, maybe four notes, and I didn't know real chords. Yeah. So I taught myself. And he's like, I see what you're doing there. Let let me show you like what you're doing. Yeah. And he taught me theory, music theory. Like right away, he taught me like how chords work, how they're built. And um, I started to understand just like the rudimentary stuff. And it turned on a light bulb for me. Yeah. And so right away, I was writing songs during Stay What You Are that would go on to the next album in Reverie. And I was just like expanding my horizons yeah it was like an extremely fun creative time and i learned so much from rob that's amazing i I like that you weren't like just trying to like okay we we, everybody loves this record so we have to keep that same right right vibe and energy because we you know this is what we sound like now instead you got inspired i think it's partly me being oblivious too like other bands like recognize what they have and they capitalize on it and i think that's mad chill (laughs) yeah 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 i was just like (laughs) hella psyched on songwriting like just really really into it stepping your game up and everything yeah just like really nerdy about it too like learning and learning and learning yeah and uh and just having a blast and then rob saw that in me and he helped me he connect the dots and to go further and then a friend of mine that i grew up with this guy joe nemeroff a really good guitar player came over to my house one time after we had made stay what you are it was the sum that summer yeah and he showed me five different jazz chords in five different positions and that was like that was it it unlocked something for me Holy and like shit. i understood guitar in a way i never did before yeah and like that just sent me on another whole other path and that's how i started writing those super weird songs for in reverie (laughs) (laughs) so when um so when um stay the way you are yeah stay what you are stay what you are comes out that was receptive was amazing right people loved it that was like that that was the the peak well our, our highest charting record was in reverie Okay. But the peak of like our success uh, was definitely "Stay What You Are." We were, um, when that record came out, we made this video called "At Your Funeral." Funeral I was going to say that with Maureen Egan directing, and it turned out super cool. But MTV Two picked it up and yep. played it at, on the day it came out every hour on the hour. Holy shit! And we were like, "This is wild, dude!" And we had and we got picked up uh, on tour with Weezer too to do this our first arena tour. So we're on tour with Weezer, playing arenas. For you the like first them? Time. You love them already? Loved Weezer, obsessed with Pinkerton and the Blue Album. Okay. So it was like, oh my god, we get to be on tour with our heroes. This is insane. Watching them sound check from the back of the arena, like yeah. all the way up in the nosebleed seats. They were nice like, to you guys too. They were they were really nice, but they didn't like hang out that much. Yeah. you know, like they did yeah. their own thing and everything. But it was just cool to like crazy to be in that world, and we're on a bus like for the first time. <sighs> And because of the accident, you know, Rich Egan was like, we got to get you on a bus. You know, it's going to be, you guys are going to be out there February in the winter and everything, Smart. you know, and so let's keep you safe. Yeah. And, but then it was like larger than life. I remember yeah. you guys had a bus on your yeah, tour. We go up on there like, what is happening? This is insane. I know. That might have been our first bus too, actually, to be honest. And yeah. It's, it's like rock and roll daydream, you know? It is, You're man. It's like, this is wild just like living and sleeping just it's it's just so much better it's just crazy and it just becomes like a movie so you had your own bus on that tour own bus damn and uh and we were like watching on our bus mtv2 every hour they play the video they play at your funeral Holy and it was just shit. like my eyes were Surreal. bugging out of my head man yeah yeah <laughs> and that song was crazy crazy reaction to that, that song? song was the most added song on radio in the nation that whole summer more and more ads until september 11th and then okay. September 11th happens, and they pull that. Remember, they pulled the Jimmy Eat World record that was yeah. called Bleed American, and they yep. had to pull it and put it back yeah, out funeral. as the self-titled, I think. Okay. Um, but they pulled our song, because at your funeral, like right then, the nation was like traumatized, and so yeah. the radio directors didn't want anything on the airwaves that would make people feel like really sad. And Got you. Says, those lyrics were like... That record, we had had this near-death experience, so I was like thinking about life in a really deep and kind of like, kind of insane way. You're looking yeah. under the surface and going like, you're kind of freaked out, like, what the hell is going on? What is this all about? Life mm-hmm. and death, you know? So yeah. the first song is at your funeral. It's intense. Like I'm starting to get he- really intense. Yeah. And so they pulled it because of the content. And wow. so right then, that was sort of like the record scratch moment. But we get we did get to go on tour with Blink-22 and Green Day on the Pop Disaster Tour that year. Jimmy Eat World did the first half out west. We did the second half in the east coast. And um, and Matt from the Get Up Kids loves to remind me that they asked the Get Up Kids first. And they said no, so they got saved today. 
<laughs> but, but that was amazing because like that was the biggest rock tour that whole summer playing sheds it's like thirty thousand people a night we play sold out madison square garden with them Damn, and dude. it's us then green day then blink 22 every single night and like those guys take us under their wing and they're like we love what you're doing and that was just like holy shit like being accepted by like these these dudes really made us feel like okay we're doing something something yeah. good here did that freakish video come out after that? So we we did the freakish tour in between the Weezer tour and the Blink One Eighty Two Green Day tour. And the funny story on the Weezer tour, we were planning that video, okay. and so backstage, walking around the hallways, corridors every day, we would be like brainstorming. And uh, Brian and Ted and Eben had this funny idea to have the video be Muppets and models <laughs> at a bar hanging out. So m- models like hanging out, hitting on Muppets like at a bar, and. So we uh, we couldn't afford the real Muppets. We got these things called monster puppets, and we did our video. But oddly enough, <laughs> Weezer's next video after oh, that sh- tour is they got the real Muppets. Holy shit. And so, yeah, I did an interview for somebody recently, and they asked me about the Muppet Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so you think they've been inspired by you guys? We figured they heard it through the walls, you know, but it could have just been like a wild coincidence. And it's if it was, though. it's pretty wild. Oh, yeah. hell yeah, dude. So you had so you, they had the real Muppets. You guys had like the D-rate Muppets. Yeah, yeah, it was sick, man. <laughs> the bootleg Muppets. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so how many tours after that? Did that tour go for a long time for the album. That tour, yeah, we toured for a long time for on uh, "Stay What You Are," and we we're playing like radio shows, flying dates, and uh, it was incredibly exciting. And that's when we started uh, getting approached by like serious major labels and everything, mm. you know. And so, um, but we met this guy Luke Wood from DreamWorks, and he was of the same world too. Okay. So this is the first guy, that quote unquote, suits of the suits who we were like, we felt like kindred spirits. He really gets it we too. We loved stuff. him. He was from the scene. He understood music. He cared about music. He cared about art. And we were like, okay. So we be, we got a, became friends with him. We had a relationship. Yeah. So then when we make the next record, we're still on Vagrant. So we go and we make uh, In Reverie with Rob Schnaff again. We start finishing in Reverie when we're doing the mixes, when all the major labels start coming in during the mixing and sitting Damn. there and listening to the whole record. And it's a massive bidding war. You know, Warner Brothers, Atlantic, Elektra, um, DreamWorks. Um, met with Jimmy Iovine. We got to go to Jimmy Iovine's Holy shit. office. We meet with them. Then we go have dinner at Jimmy's house. He what? brings us to his house, and it was Monday night. His staff was off, so he had the Chinese food restaurant down the street come it to his kitchen and Holy cook surreal. dinner for everybody. And out it was here? crazy. Yeah, and we got to hang out, and, and Gavin and Gwen just had their wedding in his backyard. So he's like, here's where everything was. We walked down this hallway, and there's a movie theater, full on movie man. theater. And it's always like, come on, check this out down there. There's a concession box down there with like popcorn and Holy candy and everything like, in his house, man. Wow. So we're like hanging out. Like it was so surreal. Like this guy's the boss. Yeah, he is the boss. And we, we couldn't believe it. But um, was Vagrant upset about this? Or no, no Vag- Vagrant was psyched. Rich, yeah. was, Rich was our manager. Yeah. And he was like, we got to do this. Like okay. this is happening. This is the trajectory. And we got to take this chance. Mm-hmm. So we really liked everybody at DreamWorks. And yeah. uh, they were really supportive of the arts. You know, and they they really got the record too. They could see where we were coming from, and you know, some of them, uh, like Lenny Warnker, like was friends with Brian Wilson and yeah. were tracked with Brian Wilson. He's like, I see what you're doing here. Like, so when you're doing background vocals, it reminds me of Brian. That like tripped me out. Luke Woods is like, you sound like a young Paul McCartney, and that's Damn. all I needed here. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Let's. Where's the? Oh, let's, we just got into let's the do Beatles. This. Yeah, <laughs> let's awesome. let's do this. So that was an incredible thrill. We have wow. like we go and have a meeting with David Geffen at his house, and it's like Jack Warner's mansion in Beverly Hills, and it's like holy. There's fuck. like we're just hanging out, just like punk kids from New Jersey. Punk kids from New Jersey. We're hanging out with David Geffen, and like in his uh, sitting room, there's like the coffee table where we're resting our drinks. He goes, "That's a five thousand year old piece of alabaster you're resting holy your drink on right now." Shit. Like, dang. What's oh, up, dude? Rusty in the Rusty. house, ladies and gentlemen. My God, my man. <laughs> dude, how are you, dude? Good to see you. Nice see you Thanks well. for coming. This is Kyle. He's Rusty Bastache. He's doc called The Last Scene about emo. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, man. Welcome, dude. Thanks for coming. That record had a uh, real Weezer vibe to it too. Is that very much super inspired by that? Very tour? much inspired by Weezer and mm-hmm. and the Pixies. Pixies are great. I had only discovered the Pixies during Stay What You Are because I'd ask Rob Schnaff, "Yo, like, what record should I listen to? What do you like?" And he's like, "Surfer Rosa, um, Save My Life." He's like, "Surfer Rosa and Doolittle Save My Life." When I was younger. And so I dove in and I loved it. I became obsessed with yeah. the Pixies. So there's, if you listen closely, there's a lot of Pixies on in Reverie. Okay. And it's, it's kind of got a Bossa Nova vibe or even Trump Lamont vibe. Okay. Like that was definitely what we were going for. I like that. It was, it was newer inspirations. Yeah, exactly. The Beatles and, was, and Pixies. And it was pretty weird stuff. And like the band was getting into weird stuff, you know, uh, you never know what somebody slips in your drink and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden the Beatles sound super good. <laughs> what's interesting about that is that people look from you, hearing your story now pe- people then probably thought oh they changed they changed the style of, because they're on a major label but you weren't yep. even on a major label exactly. making that record you were on Vagrant yeah I'm glad you made that point point. and so people were sweating you during the making of the record that you already wrote those songs it wasn't it was gonna be that and no matter Vagrant, what Vagrant even put out the they, they put out the vinyl they had the vinyl rights DreamWorks had digital and CD yeah so yeah it was like a shared release but it was all made for Vagrant and yeah. so a lot of people don't, they think exactly what you said, that change they yourself sign the major. to a major label and then change, but that was yeah. all already going to happen. What's interesting is that, interesting is that, is that um, um, through Being Cool in 1999 and FTTW, both touring on the same record, right? Yeah. That's Epitaph, that's Vagrant. And then we we left after that and tried a major label in 2001 release for Go. Yeah, how and was that for you guys? It was interesting because we always had Melody, but we just had Matt Wallace produce it because Todd Friend loved the replacements in Faith and More. We got to pick him. He was available. Oh, we my won. God. So he did it, and we were excited to work with him. But for me personally, I already spoke about this a hundred times. I love the songs, but to me, it was too overproduced and too poppy and too clean for me because those songs still stand up live between our older songs. But hmm. we always said Melly, but when that came out, oh, we're sellouts. You're on a fucking no major way, label. You're, you're over melodic. You're fucking. We oh, always I, we, we melodic from the first seven it. inch. Yeah, dude, I loved it. Meanwhile, most of those songs were written before we even thought about signing. Exactly. See, Just go. same there thing with go, Saves man. the Day in that fucking record, though. Yeah. But see? kids only see what they want. They only think, like, oh, it's major, so you change your, your fucking style. It's not true. Yeah, you got to know the history of this shit. And you can't make their same... You know what I hate, too, is people make, make the same record over and over again. It's so fucking oh, yeah. boring. Exactly. Nobody wants to hear that shit. And people think that, like... You only listen to one type of music, only inspired by one type of music, and that's not the case for anybody. Exactly. Including H2O, who fucking loved U2 and fucking Madonna. That's what you guys used to cover. Um, like a prayer. Like a prayer, dude. And yeah. That, that shit was so dope. Thank you, man. Man, that's I still love that song now. Yeah. Because your cover made me see the song in a different way. Thank you. So yeah, from our first 70s, we had Melody, and fucking, you guys always had Melody, and so... So that record comes out, and how is that received? That record is not received very well. <laughs> <laughs> Neither was ours. Neither was ours. Yeah. Neither yeah. was our 2001 release. Go, same shit. Right? It's funny yeah. now. Motherfuckers love it now. Exactly. 10 to 20 years say people love it now. I and get it now. that's satisfying. That's satisfying. Thank think, God. Honestly. Yeah. Like, oh, you didn't know what to think. I was like, what is this? Yeah, I mean, it was different. I get that, too. Like, listening to it in the context of, like, if I were in somebody else's shoes... There, it's a lot different. Plus, I was a lot less angsty. I had worked through a lot of emotion, and that van accident really put life in perspective. Like, I wasn't, like, screaming, shouting anymore, you know? So, like, I was more reflective. And so, like, my emotions are different. I was yeah. coming from a different place, and I think people wanted that same, like, urgent vocal. Yeah. I think a lot of it is, like, that. The songs themselves are not that much of a stretch from songs like Freakish or Cars and Calories or song like Nightingale or Th- mm-hmm. This Is Not an Exit. But at your funeral, it's still same, it was the same vein of... Yeah, exactly. Cool. But I'm, like, singing in, uh, you know, I'm sort of pushing still. Yeah. And then by the time In Reverie comes out, I'm more, like, thinking about stuff. You yeah, know? and so you're the, growing as a person, as right, a human. You know, right? What I mean? like, exactly, exactly. The vocals definitely were a, a step away, but in a, a more um, artistic. Yeah, you know, I was I was learning a lot how to sing. This guy went fucking NYU. This kid's a smart kid. He told me all kinds of shit already. <laughs> and he's a fucking poet. I'm sure you could relate. Like as a singer, when you're out there, you got to play a thousand shows. Like the wear and tear it starts to get really hard to keep your voice in shape. Yes, you know. And so I was also learning that. 
So after a you know a hundred shows in a row, like and it, and it hurt, it hurt to sing. Yeah, you know I've also had to learn like oh wait, like I need to learn a new way to sing, you know, to keep my keep my voice together. Yeah, and so that was a whole other thing as well. So I was sort of finding my a new range that was comfortable. Yeah, so that was another part of the process. Like I was consciously trying a different thing. Did you take vocal lessons and stuff? No, I didn't. I learned on my own, and it was Rob Schnaff pointing me in the right direction he's like check out like al green sam cook and stuff these guys will go for it but they're also sing in a relaxed way and the yeah. motion's still there the delivery's spot on yeah you know it's so like check that stuff out so i started singing along to a lot of beatles records mm-hmm. and they sing high and low you know yeah. but in so but with confidence the whole time yeah so that's kind of how i was cutting cutting my teeth at the time mm-hmm. like learning how to sing and thank god i got to go on that journey because now I'm so far into that journey of like learning about my instrument, my voice. Yeah. That now I can do a little bit of everything and with power as well. Yeah. So nowadays when I sing those in reverie songs, like I go for it a little more. Yeah. I think back then for me too, like you, you would just sing from the wrong spot and blow your voice out. Or yeah. Just, you, exactly. You so caught the moment. Yeah. You think you can't go off without pushing from, a, you know what I mean? So right. It exactly. It's all in the throat at first. Yeah. But then moving it down to the diaphragm. I learned a lot from Davey from AFI because he he was taking lessons and he'd teach me like what he was learning and the, like, the warm ups he'd show me his warm ups and stuff. Yeah, his great warm ups. And so like I kind of learned how to like exercise the diaphragm before I got up there, mm-hmm. and uh, and that was fun to go on that journey with him. It was so cool. Like all of the punk bands that were singing, we all kind of learned. We we got pretty like invested in yeah. being good singers. Yeah, I think we. Well, that's your tool. That's your life. That's yeah. like what you do. Yeah. Um. So that record when when it came out. Did any of the negative feedback bother you? Was that pre-internet? Oh, God, it's the hardest chapter of my life, like as a creative person. Because you believed it and loved it because you put I it out. I loved it, and DreamWorks loved it, and they were so inspired by it. And then like a, mo- a month after we put it out, uh, Geffen sold the label to Universal, and they cut the entire roster except for us, Jimmy Eat World, uh, Brand New, and um, I forget who else. So we wind up on Universal, and okay. we, we love Jimmy. Um, but we also were like really scorched by this whole process. Like even the first week the album came out, radio directors were like, "Yo, we dig saves the day, but like these songs don't fit the format." It was like Limp Bizkit and Kid Rock and stuff at the time, and so like we just didn't sound like we we didn't fit with that. Yeah. So right away the record, they were like, "We got to start thinking about the next record," and this is like within the first week, and that was just traumatizing. Fuck. So then they sell the label. We wind up on Universal, but we were like reeling from the whole thing. We asked um, graciously if we could get off the label. And so they let us go, wow. but they fulfilled the contract. So we were able to take that money and build our own studio. So we knew that, hey, we can still make our own records. Um, That's and, amazing. But we could do it our way now. And because we were real phased out from that whole experience, like definitely clipped wing. It hurt. It really hurt bad. But because we had our own headquarters now, I was able to bring myself back to life on my own, recording my own my own stuff that I just made me happy, you know. And then yeah. and then we just went back to Vagrant. We're like, can we come back? So oh, with open arms, they welcomed us back. We make the next record on our own, but they pick it up. And thank God, we just kept getting to have a career because sometimes that'll kill a band. Totally, man. The same thing kind of happened with us. Both those labels merged, and then MCA went away. Yeah. And so we were lucky just to get off. We were just off. We don't own that. We don't own that record, but we got to go free. Yeah, we had one more option. We had one more option. We didn't. So like, yeah, we opt yeah. out. Yeah, sure. Oh, it was your option. That's yeah. Well, awesome. I mean, the label went under anyway. So right. But then we right. took. Then we had a seven-year hiatus of records, and we did nothing to prove it. Bridge Nine, which became our. Our biggest record, yeah. which was crazy. We're very lucky, but the kids waited for seven years, but it was hard. Yeah, because- dude. It is. It's it's weird, too. Is I feel like as I get older, the years go by a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly it'll be like four or five years between a record, and I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. So how long was, was from that record to your next record? That was, um, it was only two years till we started recording the next record, but it came out in 2006. So it was three years in between that. Okay. Um, but like I was lit up as a songwriter. I'm glad I got to go through that whole thing. I went through a phase of like writer's block for a while because of being so hurt by the Unrevery thing. I yeah. wound up like everything that I wrote, I would judge. I'd be like, that's not good enough. I don't like it. This shit Watch sucks. Your like everybody else's voice was in my head now, you know? Mm. And that was the first time I was totally like unaware, like sort of 
blissfully oblivious like as a writer until then because i've been, been lucky enough for every everybody who dug the stuff up until then yeah but suddenly you start you thinking like, like, or anything or no just like not doing music at all no point? no okay. I, c- I couldn't i couldn't stop we were so lucky at that point we already had this established thing yeah you know, like i knew how lucky i was brian the only other original member had he quit after stay what you are because he just didn't want to do it anymore. We we're getting so big. He just he felt uncomfortable in front of big crowds, and we were getting TV, wow. TV spots. He didn't want to do any of that stuff. So Brian quit. That was the only moment where I was like, "Do I want to do this without him?" But I I couldn't stop. I just lo- you know I loved it so much. Yeah. You know. So I just I just kept going. And uh, was it weird making a new record without anybody that was original? It wasn't because right from day one, even before we became Saves the Day, it was me and Brian with like a revolving cast of supporting characters Got from you. day one. We had like a kid play bass from some other high school because we put up a flyer, you know, yeah. in Princeton Record Exchange and they're like, oh, I want to be a bass player. Okay, come on, be our bass player. Awesome. But that guy didn't work out. So then I'd play bass and we get a singer who didn't work out. So I started singing. And um, from even from the first demo, Saves the Day demo, to the first Saves the Day album. It's a whole new band. There's new people in the band. From the first Saves the Day album to Through Being Cool, it's all new people except for me and Brian. So we were used to that happening. Gotcha. Like every 18 months or nine months or something, there'd be a new person in the band. Somebody yeah. couldn't make it on tour. We didn't want to tour with somebody, so we'd get like a replacement guitar player. So it was really no- normal. And there's been, been there. like 20 plus members of Saves the Day. Damn. Yeah, it's like Spinal Tap. <laughs> so how was that next record received and how people dug it i mean i was did you really, go back to kind of like the i was just angry you know mm. so it had a little bit more fire you know yeah so um so people i think could relate to that that were into like emo and stuff because i think they they missed that on in reverie like that that angry sort of angsty thing yeah but it was back it wasn't a conscious thing that's just how i felt and if you listen to sound the alarm that record it's a really weird record, and a handful of those songs were written for In Reverie, but we didn't put them on In Reverie. So it's another thing people think like we mm. went had, we went back to an old style. But you listen to songs like Don't Know Why or Hell Is Here on that record or Sound the Alarm. They're like really, really weird. It's just it's like In Reverie Part Two, but I was fucked up and angry and sad and shit. So it was hella emo again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> because got, of you fans for fucking turn. But we also got Manny in the band. Oh yeah, Manny, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Manny from Glassjaw and Shift. Yeah. He legend. So legend. he um Steve Evitz, uh Rob Schnaff wasn't free to work on the Sound the Alarm. We were gonna make it with him again. He wasn't free. And I didn't want to work with anybody unless I knew them. So I call up Steve and I'm like, are you free? He's like, yes, let's do this. So Steve came out to make that record but we had parted ways with our bass player Eben because we weren't getting along and it wasn't the right thing so we needed a bass player and Steve was like I got the perfect guy and so he brought in Manny awesome. Manny tracks the album and he shreds it's the bass on that record is so killer he's the best bass player he's just amazing yeah and so right away it was like I was so lucky to get these players that were just like on the top of their game we also had Pete Parada from Face to Face oh shit Pete yeah He's yeah, he Great is drummer, so amazing. Dude. He's with the Offspring now. Yep. He's hands down one of the best drummers Good in the dude world. Too. What a, and he's an incredible dude, and he was like, he was so far. He's been one of my best friends to ever play with in the, in the band. He was so supportive, and like it was like a true bandmate. He was awesome. creative. He loved working together. He loved the new stuff. He was on fire for it. He tracked in Reverie with us, and he loved it. We got to go through all that together. Yeah. And so I wasn't like alone, you know, and yeah. then, uh, and sound the alarm, he moved to Chico and we were like, we would be working on the songs every day in our studio. And, uh, and so we got to bring that together to, to life together. It's cool. And, um, and that was, that was a real gift to have Pete along. And then we get Manny and I was still with David. Okay. And so it was still, it was a unit and like, because yeah. I was used to everything changing every so often that didn't phase me out at all. Yeah. yeah. So that, what's that? Yeah. It's a great lineup. Yeah, it is yes, a great, it is it a great was, lineup. That was a sick record, man. I love Sound the Alarm. And so that went well too, touring with that and all that stuff. And yeah, that went great. And we were back out there, and like I was. Were people like we have you back now? Were people very supportive? Yeah, and, people were really supportive, and um, it was already a couple years later, so people weren't like ticked off about it in Reverie anymore. You know, they were <laughs> like, "Oh shit, these songs sound cool live." Like, what was I thinking? Like, I kind of like it. Yeah, see? It's weird, but Saves the Day has always kept changing. So, like, maybe we should expect that from them. 
Yeah. You know, so we started to kind of settle into that as well. Like we can kind of do whatever we want. And we have that core group of fans. Like they didn't all leave. You know, they were still there. Did you feel like you lost some? Oh, definitely. Like the like the people that are into trendy music. You're on tour with Blink-22 and Green Day. Like people just got into it because it's a trendy band. Yes. They go on to the next thing. Yeah, that's you know? true. But there was so much good music then. You know, like Fall Out Boy's on the radio. My Chem's out there. Yeah. Yellow Card. New Found Glory is on TRL and stuff. You know, so there were still other bands like in that world, Blink-22 and everything. Yeah. So there was plenty of really good punk and hardcore and everything still out there. And we started to just branch out into that weirder thing. And then there was bands like that, like Brand New was coming up. Yeah. And Taking Back Sunday and stuff. And so um, right away, there was the world was branching out. The music world was branching out already. So there's a lot more space to fit in wherever you fit. Yeah. That's when like Screamo kind of came out too, right? Yeah, definitely. There's that band Grade from Canada yep. that like everybody's right way into Love them. them. Yeah. And then TBS was doing the dual vocals and that was like brand new. That was That's a true. super cool thing. And uh and it was a, it was an exciting time. I'm just so grateful that we were able to make it through that, you know. Yeah. So totally now it's crazy that my chem's back now. I know, and dude. And Rage Against the Machine. I know, dude. We're Thank talking, God. Oh my God, man. Where they've been our whole lives. It's crazy. It's perfect timing too, I it think. It really is. We need it. Um, all right, so after that, the next record was nine, correct? No, the next record we made, I made two more records as part of this trilogy. Okay, okay. So Sound the Alarm and then Under the Boards. Manny's still in the band there, and we got Daraja from Glass John Drums. Got you. At that point, so it's me and, me and Daraja and, and David. Make The very next year, we make a record called Under the Boards, and it was okay. the continuation of this journey. Sound the Alarm is all, I was deep in my psyche, so I'm like, I'm, I have to, I'm in therapy, oh, like shit. learning about myself, and so I'm writing about the whole experience, but it unfolded over this year-long experience of this explosion of ideas, and like right away, as I start writing this stuff, there's so many songs coming out, like I don't know where to put Overflowing, them. Overflowing, yeah. So I put the 12 together that fit for Sound the Alarm, but right away I knew where it was going to go on the next album. Damn. So I continue the evolution, like Sound the Alarm's like, I'm fucked up. And Under the Boards is like, I got to change. I got to do something about this. I got to come back to life. And there, there are songs that I wrote before Sound the Alarm that made it onto the second record, Under under the Boards. And then the third one's called Daybreak, where it's like, oh my God, I get it. I understand why I'm like this. But I could do this. I understand like what's going on. And I yeah. feel, all right, I'm back. And there's songs that I wrote for, during that explosion of ideas that wound up on Daybreak. And the whole time I'm like crafting the lyrics to like as a handoff from one record to the next and using a lot of images, shared images, but... The next time on the next record, I'd use it in a different context. Holy and shit. On the third record, I wound up using chord progressions from Sound the Alarm that were minor inflection, but I would make it the relative major inflection using the same kind of lyrics, but now I'm coming back to life instead of... Holy shit, I want to fucking... It's really Get deep a, shit, man. It was hell of fun, man. My mom framed this. It's like this, therapy, man. It's yeah, it was, man. The, my mom framed this massive chart that I was working on where I had all the lyrics from Sound the Alarm and all the lyrics from Under the Boards and all the lyrics I was working on from Daybreak. And I'd be highlighting themes and like drawing little stars and arrows like, Holy okay, I'm going to bring this back over here and this is where this connected on Under the Boards and this is how I want it to resolve and... It was fun Holy as hell, man. Shit. It's fun as hell. Then we finished that. Um, but therapy I, helped make that happen. Pretty it was much. all the therapy because it was I was unraveling the knot that was tied up inside me from so many years of like nobody teaches you how to be comfortable being a human being, you know. So it was a lot of hugs that I didn't give myself from on as a, like a kid, and then all wow. this trauma from the unreverie experience. Like I was just fucked up. But I, the, my band found me this Buddhist therapist in Chico. They're like, this guy's going to be perfect. You need to do this or we can't be in a band anymore. So I start like Fuck. unraveling the knot, you know, and thank God I learned how to meditate. And uh, and I was just taking all those experiences and the images that would surface in meditation, just putting them in the lyrics, you know, and it's just like really amazing, bringing man. myself back through songs, through music, you know. And by the time we made Daybreak, um, David had left the band, so I needed a new guitar player. And that's when I found Arun. And Arun and, and Rodrigo, they, they're uh, the guitar player and bass player in Saves the Day. They've been in the band longer than anybody now. Okay. They've been in the band over 10 years. Awesome. As soon as I found these dudes, I knew that I had my musical brothers. I would play them stuff, and they didn't, they didn't uh, think twice about it. They, they got it. They understood yeah. where I was coming from. These guys like studied music. They, they went to, uh, uh, Arun went to Berkeley. Rod studied um, 
harmony as a minor in college damn man. you know in theory and stuff so these guys got it like when i showed them like a chord that was sort of abnormal like oh you're doing that a minor seven flat five thing there i was like oh god this isn't gonna be a struggle yeah, yeah. So yeah. I finally had my guys and making Daybreak with Arun and Rodrigo was like a dream come true. And that's when I really started to feel really good again. Yeah. So we put out that record and Daybreak is one of my favorite Saves the Day records. Okay. We tore on that and uh, the fans who had been there the whole time like understood and they're along for the ride. And now I felt I felt really settled. I turned 30. I felt really wow. settled, you know. So I was like, okay. I get what I'm doing. I'm so grateful. And then the next record we wrote, um, I was through all of this reflection for myself. So I started looking kind of outward. Like I wanted to write songs that would help people. Yeah. So we made the self-titled record. Um, I think in 2013 or 14, we're back on Equal Vision. We're back home. I make, I write a bunch of songs that felt like this is like a perfect combination of all the styles Saves the Day has done. So yeah. I'm like, this is the self-titled record. But it was also the point where I discovered lyrically that I could still write about all these deep feelings I was having, but I didn't want to trigger anybody else's emotions. Mm. So I really got psyched on writing words that wouldn't make anybody sink okay. in their feelings. And the way I describe it is like it's as simple as like instead of saying but, you say and. Yeah, yeah, You yeah. know, because but has that minor feeling and and is more major. Yeah. So I got <laughs> super into like the science of words and how they hit wow. people. and. That was really thrilling. So, like, I wrote every song about something that you could, like, freak out about, like, paying the bills or, like, a car wreck or something yeah. like that. Or, yeah. like, the world's, you know, like, a f apocalypse, what's going to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. and I was like, I'll still be here. I still love you. We got this. It's fucking awesome, and that was man. the self-titled record. And then after that, I wrote Nine, which is, Nine is a reflection on this journey, man. So, it's about how lucky I, I've been to play music it's about loving being on the road the world was so fucked up like i was like i need to write something about joy and love and something that like talk about positivity you know yeah. like, this is what we need right now you know i've already written about how i feel about this this mess mm -hmm. i've already written everything i could say about this this world and and i'm feel good about what i've said but uh i want to bring some joy you know so i was like this is what i love the most yeah and so i wrote about it and the whole first half of the record is about like being in the band, the journey on the road, taking off, you yeah. know, and uh, and just being excited to you know be doing it. The second half of the record on the, on the, on the vinyl, you flip it over, the entire side two is one song. It's a twenty half, twenty one and a half minute long song, called Twenty Nine, and that song is about my entire journey as a human being, but through my relationship with music. My first memory is laying in bed as I'm like, I don't know how old, but I could hear my, in my temple against the pillow, I could hear my heartbeat. And yeah. it was like a drum. And, and I was like mesmerized by the beat. And I would like, as I'm like in between dreaming, see in my mind's eye, like these marching men going by. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and it was like this rhythm. And then early on uh, through on the radio, I was obsessed by what I later found out was the kick drum. It was that thump, thump, yeah. thump, thump. I was like obsessed with it. And I'd be walking around as a kid just with these rhythms in my head. So that's why later on I was like, I want to be a drummer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was obsessed with these rhythms and I'd get them stuck in my head for like days at a time. It'd be like a hook, like a rhythmic hook in my head. And I didn't understand, you know, but so uh, the first part of 29 is called Heartbeat. Okay. So and it's seven songs in one. It's like a song Fuck. suite, and so I go I'll through. Listen to that. Yeah, it's fun. It's a fun tune, you know. So yeah. So through my relationship with music is basically how I came online as a human being. So it's like the first stanza is about the heartbeat. The next stanza is about in the blue sky you hear the birds and you're like, oh my god, there's like singing in the blue sky. So I'm starting to like wake up to life through hearing sounds. Yeah. And then the third stanza of that song is called is is about the radio. My dad said one of my first words ever. I came up to his side of the bed, I pointed at the clock and I was like, Radio. Oh shit. So I was like obsessed with those electric sounds coming through the radio. So then the next part of twenty nine is uh like hitting the road in the van and turning up your favorite song. Just being psyched, like so in love with music. It's yeah. called So in Love. And uh and then from there we go on the journey where now we're hitting the road. So it's like retelling the story of how i got to be in the band starting from day one in my obsession with music 
It's fucking. And there's so much about you, man. It's so deep then, though that you hold. It's like very therapeutic in your whole journey. Oh, it was so fun. I had so much fun constructing 29, and I was like, man, it'd be so cool. The final song is called New Jersey. The final song of that suite is called New Jersey, and it's about my parents. Okay. And how like they gave me the strength to get through this this life and in this world through their unconditional love and support, just the joy in their eyes. And so that song I wanted to finish in the key of Ode to Joy. Okay. So I constructed the whole song so that after these six songs in the suite that came before it, I could wind up in the key of Ode to Joy at the end. Fuck, man. Yeah, it was hella fun, dude. It's fucking... It was fun as shit. Fuck, man. It's nice to have a... Berkeley guys go on that journey. Yeah, right. They, yeah, they, they help it's so crazy. much. Berkeley and NYU. Me, it's fucking. Yeah, they help me so much bring this stuff to life. It's so good to have musical brothers. Yeah. And, fuck, man. And then when did you become a dad? So I became a dad in 2005. Uh, I found out in 2004. My daughter's born May 24th, 20, 2005. Yeah. Bob Dylan's birthday. It's hella cool. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that changed my life. I was so ask you when we changed. made Sound the Alarm, I had been looking to buy a house in Chico that had like a basement that I could build a, a studio, but they don't do basements much out here. So I found no. a place with the guest house. And I was planning on turning it into the studio, but uh, we got pregnant. And so Luella was going to come around. That's my daughter's name, Luella. That's a great name. She was about to come around the time that we were going to record with Steve in LA. Yeah. He's like, yo, let's just build the studio now. Let's make the studio now. Let's make it at your house. Let's make the record at your house. So because of Luella, I got to uh, expedite that part of the, the journey. That's like, awesome. Build the place where I get to make records forever. And it's like my, that's, I spend every day there when I'm, when I'm at home. It's just like right behind my house. Okay. And uh, Luella now, it, that's her favorite spot to hang out. Like she has a bedroom in the main house, but she sleeps in the studio because I have bunk beds built into the oh, wall. Oh man, that's amazing. So, so when she, so we'll do like a week on, week off with her, her mom and I. And uh, she'll, when she's with me, she just stays in the studio. It's like her private bungalow. That's amazing, So dad man. gets kicked out and she's back there. She's got all, all the space she wants and it's like <laughs> she has her own house back there. How'd you end up there in Ke- Chico? Her, her mom grew up in, in Durham, the okay. town like right outside Chico. And okay. when we first got together, she came out to Brooklyn to try to live with me, and she, but she didn't have family and friends around, you know? So I'm like, I'm, I'm on tour in Europe and she's got nobody there. Yeah, so I'm like, sense. yo, I love Chico. I'd played Chico before on tour. And I, like right away back in the day when we went there, I was like, something feels familiar about this place. I really love this town. Yeah. So I was like, I'll move to Chico. Let's do this. And right away when I moved there, I was like, I knew I was home. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. So I'm so glad I wound up out there. And it's actually, if you looked on a map, Princeton and Chico are on the exact same line. The Mason Dixon line It runs all the way out to uh, actually on the back of our new album nine. There's a a picture of a a highway. um, And that is the Mason Dixon line. It's over the Mason Dixon line, so there's like a gushing underground river right under there, and it goes all the way back to Princeton. Wow! Yeah, it's amazing, man. Yeah, is your daughter into music too? She is. She's into. Uh, she's a theater kid, and okay. so she's going to this performing arts high school we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. And so she loves musicals. She gets like all sick parts because she she's it's pure singer. She hits these pure notes that are like right dead on. She's been taking vocal lessons since she was young and piano lessons and she plays ukulele and guitar um but her th- real focus is theater she okay. loves it so i get to see her in into the woods when i go home this next week that's amazing I'm really amazing. how old is she now 14 just started high school it's a trip dude <sighs> such a trip right? man it's scary man it's wild and max is two years older yeah it's crazy man i'll be calling you for advice you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> does she like your music she doesn't like listen to it, but she like digs it. You know, she yeah. digs that I'm in the band. When she comes out to the shows, she's like, "Wow, that was really cool." Yeah, but you know, she's like doing her thing. Yeah, you know, it's like, Dad, what, is, what okay, kind of Dad. music does she like? Billie Eilish. Max does too. Well, it's cool because she's of our world too. You know, yeah. like, and so many of our friends work for her. And I know. Everything. I realized and, like, it the other day actually. Like, I saw Billy Joe like it, uh, interviewed her in Rolling Stone recently, and like, this kid's a rebel. He's like, so he's backing it. So yeah. I just think that's so cool. Like, what an amazing example in the world of pop. Like a, a real punk rocker out there. Yeah, she's a vegan activist, and no, she, she, Max showed me her lyrics, and she's like, she doesn't say she's straight edge, but she doesn't party. She sings songs. Like against partying and stuff yeah. like that. That's really... It's so positive, man. It is, man. That's what the world needs right now. Yeah, she has know? such a cool 
cool look and everything. And I like know, image. dude. So dope. Like, we need that pendulum to swing back. Yeah, I want to see. Do you see you play live yet? No, I can't wait to go, though. Actually, the drummer for Hot Rod Circuit, who's on tour with us for this. this yeah, band. we went into him at the coffee shop. Yeah, Mike shop. Porman. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told me he works for her. That's right. Yeah, Mike Porman, it works for her. And Brian Marquis from Warp Tour did the acoustic basement t- stage on Warp oh, yeah, Tour. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like the tour manager, he's like the boss. And oh. it's all punk rock. Like, I, I heard her manager, too, used to manage pop punk bands and stuff. Yeah, she announced her tour next year. It sold out, like, fucking, like, two seconds it's or something. It's just so dope, you know? Thank God for this world. It is. Thank God. So, <laughs> you know, we're lucky to... We can, can you believe we're part of this, like, whole strange subculture that's, like, rose to it, the surface, And man. we're still doing it. I know, man. After, like, 20 years and shit. It's wild. It's we're, a dream. We're, we're very lucky, man. It's like, we dream. never gave up and just kept I know. doing our shit, you know what Thank I mean? Thank God. Regardless of what people thought of us or said or anything. Um, do you have any regrets in life? No, I don't. Because you learn along the way. Yeah. You know, every step, every misstep is another, you know, another lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any daily rituals? A million. Yeah, a million. You're a coffee guy. I asked you that earlier because I became a coffee I'm guy. I'm a coffee guy. I'm a coffee guy. When I'm home, I wake up. Typically, like I get my daughter uh, breakfast and make the lunch. I get her to school. Do you drive her there or take the bus? I drive there. It's only two miles from my house. Sick. My son, so it's too. it's like four minutes away, four awesome. minutes back. And then I'll take the dogs to the park. We have the fifth largest city park in North America in Chico. It's actually where, um, when they made the first filmed uh, Robin Hood, that was Sherwood Forest. Oh, shit. Yeah, so like Errol Flynn used to hang out up there Damn. and stuff. It's wild. And there's Warner Street in Chico. is named after Jack Warner. It was like one of his play- favorite places to hang out. Oh shit! So it's this lush park, and like that's it's nice. My therapist actually was like, when I was really, really down and out, he's like, "Go to the park," and it was amazing what it did. Like just breathing in that fresh oxygen, yeah. like you feel like you're not alone. Like the nature's there, like almost comforting you, and like it's like there it's to awesome, help man. you and stuff. People need and to do that more. Just get out in the park and yeah, just chill. Just themselves. breathe the oxygen and stuff, and listening to the birds and everything, and like the water going by. There's music everywhere. Yeah, and the wind in the trees and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm nerdy about it. <laughs> I love so it though. I love it. I'll take one the with dog, nature. Yeah, take the dog to the park, and then I like uh, like read a little time for reading, and then write creative writing, and then music. I've been doing this uh, YouTube channel. Um, it's like I think YouTube.com/c/ Christopher Lane Conley is like my channels. I've been uh, I only recently started that, but I'll do like requests and covers and Sick. songs and stuff. So. I'll, I try to do one of those and then uh, work on some songs. I've been producing bands in Chico. And uh, so I'm, I'm just like, so I'll, I'll work all day on music. Yeah. And then daughter comes home. She heads right to the studio. <laughs> you know, she does, does, her, <laughs> does her homework and like I'll make her dinner. And then like by the end of the day, I'm sitting there watching Arrested Development. Perfect. I was going to ask you if you had any favorite shows that you binge watch or anything I'm like that. I'm like obsessed with the rest of development. I've never seen that. I've got to check that out, man. Oh, dude, it's it. so smart. And you got to okay. like stick with it for a minute because it's subtle. But there's okay. like there's like these jokes that play out over the course of like over the seasons. Okay. That are just so rewarding. It's yeah. satisfying to watch that show. That's your main show. That's the one. That's definitely the one. Okay. Yeah. One of the questions I ask my guests, and I already can tell from you if you're an optimist or a pessimist, but I know that you're super posy. Full on, always have been. You've always been like that. Just like psyched to be alive. Grew up on this farm as an only child, like all alone with nature. And my parents would just leave me there. It was back in the day. What you kind know? of animals on the farm? We had pigs. So pig we talked farm, about that, that's right. And uh, I would sleep out on the hay bales when the sows were going to give birth because I couldn't wait for the piglets. And, and then I'd raise them for 4-H. Holy you know, I was a 4-H shit. kid. And uh, we had sheep, and uh, we had a donkey named Moose. <laughs> and oh, is not cats? Yeah, cats and dogs. I mean, it's the Garden State for a reason. It's like True. really, really beautiful. It's a place called Delaware Township just outside of Flemington, and it's all farms. And right now, it's, it's actually protected farmland, so it's never going away. Wow. Um, but I would just go outside, and I'd be with nature the whole time and like never felt alone. It was like I could feel the presence of nature. It was like the, even the trees were there. You yeah. Know? They weren't just trees. I had these two weeping willow trees outside my bedroom window that I'd look at. They were like my best friends. I'd go and play on them and climb in them. Yeah. And like I didn't feel alone with them. It yeah. was weird thinking back on it. But I'm really grateful for that experience. Like all alone. It wasn't until I started going to school with kids that the world got weird, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> did you did you milk cows too? Uh, no, we didn't have oh, cows, okay, okay, but okay. I, I did get to go to Amish country through a trip with school once. We had this week-long 
thing where we went to Amish country, learned all about it, and we got to milk cows, and that was yeah. a trip. Fuck, man. Just I mean, spitting it's, it out. It, it sounds like you've been very inspired at a very young age, man. <laughs> it was, and that's also the reason that I became vegetarian, you know, because I'm growing up, like, the animals were my friends. You could feel them, their presence. And then when they got sent away, you know, like, on the back of a truck, and they got brought back in these, like, wrapped packages of bacon. Oh, man. It was like a trip, you know? It made me sad. You so know, how old were you in that when you changed for that? That wasn't until later when Brian and I got into hardcore. We like found out about vegetarianism through hardcore. And we're like, yes. yo, we should give this a shot. So that was when I was 14. Yeah, yeah. fuck. Was that like maybe Cats and Dogs, Grilla Biscuits? Yes, or exactly. Like? That's what it was. I knew it. That's yeah. the Game Changer song for That's all That's what it was, dude. It's crazy. That song is so powerful. And it's, it's also a great, catchy, awesome song, which is, it wasn't it's, so preachy, but it was just factual. Yeah, dude. And New Direction, too, like about like being in a band just because your heart's in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not like being part of the trends and stuff. Like that's the message right there. Yeah. That record is so important. And it's like about evolving into like something better. Yeah. I was very lucky to sing backups on the record. <gasps> I sang backups on the whole record. I'm like the third person thanked on that record. Yeah, I lived in the GB house in 1988, and so I'd like, come sing on a record. I didn't, I didn't realize what kind of masterpiece or what kind of impact Star Today would have, but I got to be like, thou the shall not kill. And oh, I became veggie in 88. My God, yeah, dude, man. I got goosebumps all over yeah. my body right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like looking back now, like in how impact that record was for the world. I'm like so honored to be part of that, man. This that fucking, is so They changed my life for sure. Incredible. I still feel weird around Walter. Mm. I can't be cool around him, dude. <laughs> yeah, Walter's like Walter's like a genius. Like everything he touches, all the things he writes, everything. everything. The GB, the Civ, just everything he's been quicksand. involved in. He's a he's a rival shrift. schools. Rival schools. He's a he's a riff master too. Yeah, his guitar riffs are just crazy. Actually, on Can't Slow Down, I tell him this all the time. Can't Slow Down starts with the tip of the hat to New Direction. It goes dun dun dun. Oh shit! That's for yeah. That's how <laughs> much we were into them. Yeah, so what what would be maybe your top five influences? Do you have a top five? Yeah, I mean, I've got to go all the way back to um, like Aerosmith. This is random. Aerosmith no, it's not. I know your story first, now. Like I was obsessed with them. So cool. First concert I ever wanted to see. Aerosmith and Led Zeppelin are, have the, are the top two. Zeppelin made me want to play my own music. Okay. And then um, Smashing Pumpkins. Sick, great fucking band. Sunny Day Real Estate. Got one more. And uh, Archers of Loaf. But I would love to squeeze Jawbreaker and Jawbox in there. The j power of Jaw, the monsters of Jaw. Mm. Yeah, I think Jawbox is very underrated from DC. Yeah, um, I mean, for, really your own, great yeah, for your own special, Sweetheart is one of the best records ever. And that post hardcore, strange angular guitars. And yeah. that they came from DC. Yeah. You know, there's a, there, there's a connection there f from the, the world of Embrace and, yeah. and Fugazi and like Gang of Four and stuff. You know, they're putting it all together, but they have sick melodies, so it did yeah. the trick for me. No Beatles in the top five, huh? Well, I would, I mean, I'd have to put the Beatles above everything. Damn. The, the Beatles are like, I'm grateful for them, like, in life itself. Okay. The Beatles have provided me with more comfort and joy than any other thing besides, like, my hero is this guy, Joseph Campbell, who, like, writes about comparative religion and mythology. I'm like, I listen to all his lectures. There's, like, hundreds of hours of lectures on iTunes and Spotify and stuff. Like, that guy, I... Talk about my ritual. Like, that guy is with me every single day. I plug okay. him into my head. I listen to him, like, falling asleep. And uh, he's actually, he wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is, uh, George Lucas credits that for why he wrote Star Wars. He took, Holy shit. He took this monomyth, this one story that recurs in different places, just told in different, um, with different clothes and different characters. Everywhere yeah. And put it in outer space. Um, Holy shit. So, but Joseph Campbell and the Beatles are, like, they're above everything like they're up there with my parents damn yeah, yeah. no hip-hop for you oh man oh i fucking biggie dude i mean yeah. my list my leg <laughs> my list is long my list is long wu-tang and biggie were like two of the biggest things for me when i was in high school and i had a, just a tape man a t uh, walkman, walkman tape player i would listen to um biggie and wu-tang just like f just keep flipping it over and over and over the lyrics are incredible totally you know incredible, you think man. back on it, it's like real poetry and there's real music, real songs, and like I was just obsessed with it. A tribe Called Quest, <laughs> Most Deaf. De La Soul. De La Soul, like that's my shit. Me too, man. Still just like obsessed with it. That's awesome. Yeah. Listen to that, man. Nobody, oh, that, nobody probably think about it. Well, it's cool. Like hardcore and hip hop came up at the same time as like totally. dis disenfranchised youth like that needed a voice. You know? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, fuck, I think we covered Rusty. Everything Rusty wanted to say something. Rusty, you want to say something? 
about Saves a Day or that tour or anything? You were the first one on the scene when the crash happened, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think um, I want to I want to I want to go back to the weeping willow trees. I yeah. The irony of you have two weeping willow trees outside your bedroom. So emo. And, yeah, <laughs> so emo. And I was like, that explains it. All. Yeah, yeah, dude. Do. That was yeah, like right outside my my window. They were like my friends, my oh. two friends. Yeah, that, that, ex- that explains That's a lot. And the, and the irony of yeah, and I write willow. a lot about trees. There's always images of trees in my lyrics. And, uh, it, How'd you know you had weeping it, willows by his crib? What's that? Oh no, he he was saying. That's he was amazing. Saying, he was saying, yeah. But, yeah, um, it's crazy, man. But it's funny, be, be, given that, and then um, we we actually we saw you in Crazy Fest. Yeah. In, in yeah. And, and, um, and, um, and afterwards, I remember talking to you, and I was like, "You guys were fucking great," and it was instantly, instantly likable. And I was Dude. Like, we and love I, melody, man. Yeah, and I told these guys, I go, "If you haven't heard about this band." No this is way! A fucking great band. We should oh my take god! Tour with us. And oh, thank you, Rusty. Rusty. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god, dude, yeah. changed my life, man. Because yeah. that's what um that cause meant we, so much to me memories. when you liked the band and yeah. you were like supportive of us. Like that was like all I needed yeah, to feel fun. like okay, we're I doing something cool. Us in Connecticut, they drove overnight to play that show and yep. to put on. Yep. Yeah, dude, we drove overnight from Indianapolis to be with you guys. So we couldn't miss it. It's Thank you, Rusty. It's, it's, Thanks, man. Rusty and the props, right? My God, dude! <laughs> in my in my head, I, I remember clearly because we were um, we were with um, was it the, our old business manager? Yeah. And I remember we were talking. Oh yeah, we're gonna do this U.S. tour, and we were trying to work out the the bus and all this and the finances, and and I was like, we got to take this band saves a day. They're fucking great. They would be so good. For Perfect for this tour. Damn, Thank you, out. man. And I remember telling everybody, everybody in the band, I was like, listen to them. Give him a chance. Listen to him. You got to check out this band. And then, um, oh my God, I'm so, forever in your debt, man. So push that forward to, um, I think you, it was Chicago, right? Yeah. And you guys yep. met, you actually met with a label that night. That's right. That's had right. Dinner with them, um, and you were so psyched. And you're like, we're going to get an early start and head towards the next show. But our van had been towed. So we had to stay like towed. four hours later and didn't get out of there until way late. Stop and that's why. Really oh, okay. sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's but, uh, right. And we were like, okay, how about this? Since it's such a long drive, let's take Teddy. And we used to that's we right. And Teddy, Teddy Madball or whatever. Ted had hurt his hand moshing for Kill Your Idols at the Metro. <laughs> so that's why he didn't want to be in the van overnight. And so, Brian went, so he had like a buddy. Yep. And we were like, they would give you guys more room in the van. And, yeah. And, um, and I remember um, we were rolling up. Um, it must have been like four or five in the morning. Yeah. And Marvin was our bus driver. Marvin was like, wake up, wake up. There's a, there's an accident on the highway and it saves a day. And I was like, holy shit. So we jump out and we saw the van on its side. We saw the trailer in front of the van, like flipped over. Yeah. Like what? Maybe 20. Yeah. It had like yards. spun out yeah, and shit everywhere. Yeah, dude. And Dave's teeth were still embedded in the steering wheel. Yes. And, um, we're like, fuck, we got to get these guys to the hospital. Yeah, you, you drove us to the hospital, yeah. put all yeah. our stuff in the bays of the bus, yeah, yeah, we took like, us to the hospital, and you guys had to get to <laughs> Minneapolis, so you, but you left us in good hands. Well, we made sure. We're like, we got to make sure. And we were like, were so young too, man. Yeah, and we were like, don't worry about getting back. Heal up. Don't worry. And I remember you guys were so concerned. Well, we, we don't want to leave the tour. We don't want to leave the tour. It's like, leave the tour. <laughs> They're all you smashed up. You got broken bones. You got his, <laughs> his jaw, I know, had been cracked. Yeah. And pushed up into his, his oh, nasal my passages gosh. or whatever. Yeah, they had to rebuild it and yeah. everything. So I was like, okay, we got, was it like maybe not even three days later, you're back on tour with yeah, us? Yeah, we flew out. And that we were talking about how Vagrant sent, drove out this van before we were even on the label. You know, good faith. They drove out the van. We drive all the way to Seattle, play the show, and I'm in a sling still. Yeah. David was still right? getting surgery and flew out the next day to Portland to meet up with us in Portland. Yeah. 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 And we yeah. weren't going to miss it, man. The opportunity yeah. to be on tour with you guys was the biggest thing that ever happened to us, and we loved you guys so much. Yeah. It was a dream come true. Yeah, be emotional. yeah, yeah man. It is I'm so grateful for you awesome. dudes, man. It, it's funny. Back then, there was always you know, you know a lot of posturing and... and you're like, oh, we're hardcore, we're hardcore. And uh, I was like, you want to talk about hardcore? Let's talk about someone who gets in a van <laughs> accident. And three days later, they're meeting us up on tour and finishing the tour out. Most, um, like most, troopers. yeah, a lot of people would, Dude. would have gone home. They would have been like tail between their legs and be like, ah, oh, the same for me, the same for me. 
Yeah, uh, dude. Yeah. I was like the hardest guy. We were like the hardest band in, dude, thanks, in, man. in the emo scene. In thanks, the, man. In, including the hardcore scene. It shows how passionate and psyched they were to be in a band, too, and just to be out there. And, and with you guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah. really yeah. seriously, you guys are our heroes. It's crazy, uh, man. It's funny. When I, when I hear the stories you're telling, Toby, and the, the parallels that we had, even, even though we weren't in close proximity the parallels where yeah you go to a major label and you've had songs written prior there's so yeah and getting to yeah. getting to look up to you guys as an example you know and just admire what you do and respect you like it really like taught us so much you know we like Crazy. learned how to do this right now we get now we get goosebumps i know <laughs> you, don't think, you don't think that right anything like that it's saying oh to no. these guys on tour because they're, they're, we like them yeah. You don't think of any kind of impact or any connection. We, we all had fun together. Oh, that's right. it's yeah. wild to think back other. on that. Yeah. But you don't think about it now, talking about it now, 20 years later. Yeah. yeah. The impact, you got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> we're still lucky to be doing music. Yeah. We do what we love. We're so fucking lucky. Man. Oh, yeah. parents and shit. It's yeah, crazy. dude. Yeah. It's man. It's fucking crazy. Dude, and it's an honor just to come here and hang out, man, too. This, this has is, been awesome, man. I, I, I'm so happy you could do this. And yeah, this When I dope. saw you a couple months ago, I don't know where I saw you. I was like, I have to have you on my podcast. You, you're part of h I can't History. see you guys in Chico. That's right, Chico, yeah. 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 <laughs> Who the fuck were we with? I don't know, I don't know who that was with. We played that show. We ended up jumping in the van and driving straight, straight home that night. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like we uh, were kind of so close to home. but um, Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Just, All right. Well, what, what, well, last thing. Well, what, what do you think? What do you credit to your longevity career and why you're still here? Why do you think that the kids are still connected to you and you're getting new fans and you're still doing it? What drives you? I think the honesty of it. You know, it comes yeah. from a real place and it comes from a real place of joy. Like I really, really love what I do. I feel grateful, consciously grateful. All the opportunities that we've, that we've had along the ways and getting to learn from our heroes and the best people doing it. Yeah. doing it for the right reasons yeah. you know we always had the, like that mentality like okay we're only going to do this like the way we want to do it and like look at our heroes they, that's how they do it your own rules yeah yeah that's how they do it and like well, that's what we're going to do yeah and, i love know. that and it connects with people people know when shit's real or not you know yeah what I mean? like can... i feel really grateful you know it's just been such a long strange trip yeah it's been very very long man yeah could you see yourself doing anything else but music no, well I'd love to do more more writing. I think it'd be cool to work with people on like a movie or something. I think that'd be dope. I could see you being a professor or something too, a teacher. That's though, what too. I would have. That's what I would have done. I probably would have been in academia for sure. But yeah. I can still see you can do that. You could be like a professor. That's someday. true, man. Go to Chico State and finish up. Yeah, you really, you really you don't mean that, this is no disrespect to punk rock or hardcore. You never really meet somebody that's really smart like you from punk rock because it's usually like fucked up weirdos so like fuck school, fuck my parents. You had a loving family. You loved your school. You did great in school. You fucking, you graduated. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. spoke at your fucking graduation. You went to college and while you, and you still did music, it's fucking, you balanced it all, man. It's really amazing, Thanks, man. man. I've been just so lucky. You yeah, know? You're, yeah, but you, you're a true living uh person who lives the pma life i sure do man you know what i mean from like the very beginning to even now yeah dude everything life, you've been through life is good man it's yeah. tough but it's good and we got each other exactly congratulations on 20 years of through being cool you're out Thanks, here for man. that thank I'm you i'm psyched to go to donut friend on sunday yeah he loves really, donuts they're so doing gonna, they're doing saves the danish it's fucking awesome man <laughs> rusty's gonna be there with fucking who be yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, boy, works there, too. So yeah, like, our mean? friend is the manager now. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. You know that's, Cody. That's the point. That's my like dude. How, how the, the world comes full circle. I, I move out to L.A. I bump into this guy. He's like, oh, hey, you're an H2O. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, I used to tour with Saves the Day. I'm like, oh, I fucking love those guys. That's so, so became, dope. Like, oh, my God. Friends. I love that guy so yeah. much. I saw him at the Saves the Day show. We saw him there. Totally, yeah, totally. he is one of the best of the best. Beautiful, awesome family. Super oh, awesome dude. Just a great soul. I love him. Love you, Cody. Love you, Cody. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for everything you contributed Thank to music. You, Toby. Thanks for being part of H2O's Thank fucking Thank you, Rusty. Legacy, dude. being on tour with us. And it was a great time. So I was so proud of you guys. Like, we made a lost touch back then. We weren't really on the phones so much back then. But, like, after you guys did that tour, we did our thing, went our way. I was so just watching and hearing about everything you guys were doing. And I was so happy for your success. And you guys blew up. All that stuff is like, they're really good kids and they deserve that. I was really proud of you guys. Dude, thanks, like a man. dad and shit. You know thanks, what I mean? Thanks, man. Before I was a dad. Dude, I, I can't I can't thank you enough. And me and Rusty are going to try to come to your show this weekend. One of those shows. Yeah, yeah. I've got you down okay, already. Okay, sick. All yeah. right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for being thank here. You, I appreciate Toby. being in my kitchen. Thanks, man. Peace. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, please rate, review, 
uh, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, please do that. And whatever platform you are listening to this on, I'm glad you found me. You can rate me and review me on there also. So thank you guys sincerely for the support. I cannot wait for you guys to hear the next one.